Welcome everyone. Welcome to Kindred. This is Lisa Reagan. I am so thrilled to be talking to Stephanie Mines, uh, Kindred's Vice President. Yay, Stephanie, and our, one of our editorial contributors. And she is also the uh, amazing author of our first uh, publishing house book, The Great Physician. And we are going to have a minute to talk about that today. Uh, so, so welcome so much, Stephanie. Um, we have so much to get through here. I just want to ask everyone to settle in because this is a really important discussion. So all my discussions with you have been so important and so revelatory, but the two pieces we're going to unpack here today are very, very important. So Stephanie's going to take us beyond attachment, and she's going to talk about the new feminism, which is trauma-informed, but also leads us up to goddess activism. And all of these are related. I, it's it's going to be worth your time to just let's hear what Stephanie is, is saying, because she's one of those people I, I wrote about in my last editorial for Kindred, and I said... In our ancient world, we had the Rock of Gibraltar at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and it had the scary little warning on it, Ni plus ultra, which means no more beyond. Don't even bother going out there because there is nothing. Well, there is, and there was, <laughs> and Stephanie today is definitely taking us beyond all the warnings of our colonized mind, as Vandava Shiva calls it, our fossil fuel brain that wants to say this is as far as we're allowed to go. Um, so we are actually going there today. So thank you so much again, Stephanie, for being My here. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Lisa. Okay. So let's take a deep breath and tackle this first piece that Kindred has been advocating for for a long time, which is attachment. And what a word uh, that has caused so much parental guilt in our culture and, <laughs> and uh, doubt in parents, uh, and, but also has pointed uh, the way to how we are supposed to be as a species. So take us beyond attachment, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for that invitation. I want to preface all of this with a statement about feminine intelligence and the daring to really reverse the kind of colonized thinking that has distorted humanity and the way in which we can be open to an entirely new worldview, an entirely new perception of who we are, what has happened to us, and what we're doing. And quite honestly, I feel that when I made this breakthrough discovery for myself and for many others, which is already proving true in the responses that I'm getting to my beyond attachment theory, that I believe opened the door to the new feminism. So that is one of the linking experiences that I wanna share with everyone listening that once we dare to step into an entirely new worldview, then that which we've been indoctrinated into, it creates this neuroplasticity that opens portals of understanding one after the other. So it is exactly as you're describing, it's a wild and glorious ride through expansive generative consciousness that is our birthright. And that goes back to my previous articles and everything I've been doing with Kindred about original brilliance and embryological unfolding, because we are in a constant state of unfolding. And so that's what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about it as a woman. I'm talking about it as a mother and a grandmother, because I really believe that 
these portals were unlocked in many ways by my experiences of stewarding my children, parenting, and evolving so that I could be a better steward for them, a better steward for them as they come into their maturity and I have grandchildren. It's my responsibility to keep evolving and understanding my own experiences of what I actually am eternally attached to and have always been attached to versus what I thought was the deficient attachment that Western psychology labeled me with, that breakthrough awareness, oh, that was physiologically, neurologically, emotionally, spiritually, completely uplifting and expansive. And I want to share that. How can I not? You know, I want to share these insights and the evidence for them. So the insight you shared on Kindred, the beyond attachment piece, um, a re reinvigorating and re-envisioning uh, attachment. It, you tell your story about being a little girl and knowing that what you're witnessing in your home, these traumatic events, uh, is not all there is. You already had a sense of being grounded in a greater matrix of life and uh, greater intelligences around you. And, you know, we have had so many responses to that article and so many people saying, me too, me too. <laughs> so I wonder if we're going to come out of the closet now and, and start telling the truth about uh, you know, as children, there was a guy a couple of years ago, Tobin, uh, heart, and he ran the Child Spirit Institute. Joseph Chilton Pierce was a big fan of his, and his work was all about children experiencing um, life differently um, than we do as adults, but until they were enculturated to believe otherwise, and then they stopped pointing to things in the garden and saying, oh, look who's here, and then they acted like, oh, that's not happening. I can't talk about that anymore, um, but it seems like the, that was acknowledged, that piece was acknowledged, but take us, why does that fly in the face of this, this broader sense of children embedded in an intelligence and knowing it when they get here to the idea of attachment where, you know, one person in the home had better be functional or, or you as a child are going to be all messed up and then everybody, it's going to be generational and, oh, wow, what a catastrophizing narrative that is. Uh, that And that totally leaves out anything greater than, um, than, than the nuclear family disaster we have going. Thank you, yes. And I wanna begin by saying that the insights I have about true attachment are not intended to negate the beauty of having a wonderful relationship between a parent and a child. Uh, and I absolutely promote that. I encourage prenatal bonding and attachment that we begin to develop healthy relationships with our children from the moment that we conceive them. So I'm not countering that, but there are times such as in my home and in the homes of many other people who I've worked with as a trauma therapist, where that's just not possible. The parents, the environment, the demographics, the sociological conditions, the conditions regarding environmental toxins or intergenerational history prohibit the possibility of that wonderful bonding between child and adult. That was the case in my home of origin. It wasn't there. It wasn't accessible. And the outcome as prescribed by Western psychology and touted by highly respected theoreticians is that therefore there are these diagnostics of insecure attachment, reactive attachment, et cetera, and as someone 
becoming a psychologist uh, in graduate school, wanting to be of service, I made every effort to fully understand this. And there was lots of evidence from my relational choices and my struggles in life that I fit the description of poor attachment, insecure attachment. And that was the logical explanation for the struggles I had. But that truth of those struggles, which were real, obscured another reality that was simultaneous with that. So Mm -hmm. parallel to the violence and abuse in my home, which was extreme, there was something else going on. And that something else was not escape from that violence. It was not avoidance. It was not compensation for that violence. It was the organic demonstration of my original brilliance. It was quite healthy and quite grounded. It was not validated or mirrored by people who didn't have the capacity to do that. And so it was heavily internalized. And that which was occurring was another kind of attachment that is completely ignored in psychological literature. What was that attachment? It was a beautiful and life-serving attachment to my own creative process. So imagination that developed resources within the imaginary realm that were not pathological at all. They were delightful. And who is to say that these companions that accompanied me in my suffering in the unseen realm were not real to me. They felt real and I relied on them. And I am talking about a sense of guardianship, a sense of coherent communication that gave me outlet to my suffering. I'm also talking about my relationship with the natural world. So I grew up in a very unnatural environment. I was living for my formative years in a tenement building in the Bronx. So I didn't have woods and fields and rivers that I could engage with, but I found the natural world. I found my sit spot, you know, that I now have in nature. I found it by looking at the stars. So I had a deep relationship with sky people, uh, with people in the heavens. And that was both the day sky and the night sky. So perhaps if a therapist, a social worker were to come in and evaluate the situation, they would probably conclude that I was disassociated and upset and staring out the window without communicating with anyone. So therefore I was a very troubled child. And to some extent there was truth in that. I was pretty unhappy about what the people around me were doing. But when I was at my sit spot by the window, I was happy. (laughs) I was connected. So here we have that connected aspect of the worldview, that connected indigenous relationship to the sky, to the stars, to the clouds, to the winds, to the rain, to all that was available to me of the natural world and that I took in in a deeply indigenous way because I made friends with and kinship with those natural manifestations. And these were my attachments. And I realized it was brilliant of me to 
have this experience. I mean, I obviously was magnetized to it. I was propelled into it, but it was a choice because I could have made other choices, um, much less healthy choices. And sometimes I did make less healthy choices, but most of the time I made choices that were not validated by the adults around me. So I kept them secret. How brilliant was that? You know, I protected this greater family that I found who brought me peace, who brought me a sense of comfort and connection and soothed my nervous system. My nervous system was eased. It was treated. It was good medicine that I discovered. And in reflecting on that, which was a breakthrough because I had to refute the Western psychological conditioning, which could also be seen as a kind of colonial uh, brainwashing that insisted on one interpretation of my experience. And that interpretation was institutionalized. It was systematized. Uh, I certainly didn't have the evolvedness that our colleague Darsha Navaz talks about that is preferable. Of course, it's preferable. I had nothing like that, but I was still healthy. I was still creative. I was still quite functional. And I prospered, not in a way that Western psychology would identify as prospering, but clearly I was prospering. And to me, the evidence is the endurability of my creativity and the fact that I have largely recovered mm -hmm. from the traumas, the extensive traumas of that time. So offering that alternate interpretation of experience feels essential. I must do this. I must do it in the interest of humanity. I must do it in the interest of the children of the future. I must do it. I would do it under any circumstances, but in the midst of polycrisis, when violence seems like the dominant reality. And I believe that we must rise up to meet that challenge. I am further encouraged to share what is a breakthrough understanding of mine that I feel has uh, evidential roots and that is being validated the more people who are exposed to it. You mentioned Darsha Narvaez. She and Four Arrows wrote the book, Restoring the Kinship Worldview, and they went through 28 of the now 50 precepts of the indigenous worldview versus our dominant worldview. We have a chart at Kindred. If you haven't seen it, you can go to the worldviewliteracy.org website, which is new, or our website, uh, and find the chart. You can download it. It's a lovely uh, tool for helping us to get quickly caught up to speed on some of the precepts of an indigenous worldview. And what you're describing here, Stephanie, in the book, Restoring the Kinship Worldview, it's so interesting to hear Darsha talk about um, you know, the relational way of being so deep. Uh, and of course, we're a part of the intelligent life here, but imagine a, a modern mother today in a neighborhood sending her seven-year-old into the woods and say, now don't come out until you meet your spirit guide. <laughs> So, which is a practice, um, of course, and, uh, and indigenous worldview, indigenous peoples. Uh, my mother, uh, you know, we were that generation that was like, uh, you know, you drink out of the garden hose and you stay outside. And I carried my broom into the woods with me so I could make paths and long ways away from my house so I could find my way back. Uh, but the... Um, confidence in life and in uh, intelligent life to be there, to care for me, that it wasn't scary and it's not uh, disassociated from, you know, my being here was established because of this, the the kind of attachment you're talking about. Um, so, and I've heard that from so many people. So tell me, 
we we're we're just now really in the United States also moving into this place of talking about trauma informed and what is it that is happening to us uh early on that is uh interfering with um our attachment well our our just our lifelong ability to be healthy and whole and this has a very interesting uh view in Scotland, where one of our board members, Susan, um, Suzanne Ziedike is working. Uh, Scotland is an attachment friendly country. So when they picked up the ACEs, uh, and they looked at what ACEs were, which they measure how much trauma you've had, which sounds like an interesting, it's a scale of one to 10, you can take the, the uh, quiz on Kindred, you can find out your ACEs score, the higher you are, the more likely you are to be sick, lifelong, and a score over four, is considered bad. And I don't know of anyone who has a score below four, actually. So like something else is helping us to survive this. But in the Scotland, because they are attachment oriented, their, um, th their approach was, well, more hugs for children, less moving around of teachers because they view in school uh, the loss of a teacher as a death to them. I mean, just incredibly highly sensitized way of responding to this idea of trauma and becoming trauma-informed. And in the U.S., we have a completely different culture. We drug people and we drug children. And so this piece that you're bringing forward here about beyond attachment, we barely have we really actually have not embraced attachment in the United States. We're way at the bottom of 143 developed nations when it comes to any kind of support for families and children. Our, our children rank last among all wellness um, and international indicators. So to take us beyond attachment when we're kind of not even getting attachment has, I think, uh, actually possibilities, because I, I think we're going to have to have more resources that we call online really quickly here to help us through the meta and the poly crises, as you said, that we're in right now. Exactly. And I want to now link the new feminism with beyond attachment. And you have actually provided that segue beautifully, because despite the ignorance uh, that we have here in the U.S. about attachment, and generally the U.S. is behind in every area of health, including emotional, psychological, physical health, it's deplorable. The people, I believe, who are going to get us out of that hole are women. So this is right now a shout out to women physicians, women who have the level of understanding that is truly trauma-informed to step into your power. So the fact of the matter is, and the evidence is clear about this, women have gone for trauma healing resources at a much greater rate than men. Women are more likely to feel uh, the impacts of trauma. They are more likely to go to workshops or to seek out a therapist. And indeed, women diagnosed with PTSD seek help for PTSD at about twice the rate as men diagnosed with PTSD. Because of that, women are more trauma-informed than men. In addition, the nature of women's brain plasticity is distinguished from men's. There is more plasticity in part because of the volatility of emotional dynamics that really begin to enter synaptical overcoupling and uncouple it, meaning habitual behaviors are more likely dismantled by people who have receptivity to that possibility. I, I, please let me know if you need me to define any of these terms further. Okay. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> we always try to remember we, we're bringing people along with us so, and we don't want to lose them in the... Uh, yeah. Exactly. That's why I mentioned this. If anything uh, that I'm saying is too neuroscience oriented and needs to be debriefed, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that women, uh, because of their somatic sensitivity and willingness to engage in trauma therapies, are deconditioning rigid behaviors uh, and willing to go into new possibilities of being with more alacrity with uh, more frequency than their male counterparts. So this puts women in a position to really be leaders in the field of breaking down rigid concepts that have lost their utility in our polycrisis world segregating people into those identified as well-attached, a small number, I might suggest, uh, and those who are poorly attached without seeing through the lens of indigeneity, without seeing through the lens of true humanity, challenging those old precepts and confidently stepping into new possibilities will, I believe, free more people to own their own voices, be voices for what they believe in, and come out of deleterious stuck behaviors. So it is always the question of, uh, and this is a trick uh, question, um, the chicken or the egg. And uh, I used to uh, actually live on a farm and I used to take chickens and eggs to my son's class. <laughs> and I would have fun with them asking that question. And then I would say, okay, wait, it's a trick question. The chicken, there is no chicken or egg comes first. The chicken is in the egg and the egg is in the chicken and the chicken is in the egg and the egg is in the chicken. And when you get that, praying, you know, <laughs> you're enlightened according to Buddha. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go with your... Uh, a uh, holistic worldview, but um, but looking at this, you know, which comes first, the uh, the attachment that is supposed to help us have, as we say at uh, Kindred, this is actually one of the pieces that we tackle all the time: is the evolved nest can't happen until we have a culture that it understands the indigenous kinship worldview, which will support creating. It's the micro macro, but one is embedded in the other. And, and so therefore as individuals, we just have to stand where we are and take a step forward and, and do whatever we can do uh, instead of let's try to see if we can, you know, what, where do we begin? It's, it's really just wherever we are. So this piece with the new feminism and moving us into the goddess one of the, uh, in the new article we have up at Kindred about this, uh, the goddess and activism, you take a moment to reorient us around original brilliance, which I think is is so important for us to feel confident in what we're doing when we're stepping out there with this vision of, uh, of remaking and rebuilding our world. Thank you for making that link uh, because all of these theories and propositions really for humanity to evolve are all linked. Original brilliance, beyond attachment, and the new feminism, they're all fluidly related to one another. The original brilliance concept comes out of my research as an embryologist and my understanding that the embryo fuels its own development and makes brilliant strategic choices aimed at manifestation to deal with all the various challenges, the holistic challenges that are presented embryologically to allow a being to come into form and to be born 
and develop postnatally. Those challenges are incredibly complex and variable, and they are structural and emotional and spiritual, and they're daunting. And they're life-threatening given the vulnerability uh, of the embryo and the strength the embryo discovers. Those embryological choices are the code of original brilliance, the way in which we navigate those challenges and emerge into our postnatal selves, shape our original brilliance, define our original brilliance. But because most of the time, those choices are not identified and they occur on a non-cognitive level, the pressures of living in the modern world obfuscate that original brilliance. It's not validated. It's out of, it's in the, it's blindsided really by adults for the most part. I would say indigenous cultures that I have experienced and that I have lived in are more likely to see original brilliance than colonized fossil fuel brains uh, in our Western world. But in that Western world, original brilliance might go unrecognized and thereby become unrecognized by that individual herself. Mm. When through the process of resolving shock and trauma, one reclaims one's original brilliance, then a whole new world starts to emerge. And I believe it's because for me, I have done that using the tools that I have put together in the protocols of the Tara approach for the resolution of shock and trauma, which I developed because I use those tools with great frequency, uh, pretty much every day of my life and consistently because they work, uh, I have been able to identify my original brilliance and continue to nurture it. And it is through that, that I had the courage to determine that the attachment concepts that I had swallowed, I was needing to vomit because they were not helpful. They were no longer of any use to me. And I posited with confidence that they were not useful to a lot of other people, that they were restrictive, limiting, and inaccurate, a small part of the story. I'm not saying they're worthless, but I'm saying that they are only a part of the story. So it's wonderful to help parents anchor their children in their wonderful regulated stewarding brains. That's wonderful to do that. I would absolutely promote that. But for those who did not have that privilege, they are not thereby classified as failed beings, as troubled beings, as people who desperately need help. That's the problem, you know, that's, that's kind of what happens. Oh, the problem is that dot, dot, dot. That's not necessarily what the problem is. The problem may be that your indigenous attachment was not recognized. So perhaps if we went in search of what those alternate attachment mediums might have been for an individual, we could approach our services to them differently, as I do now. I am working with people still who often have convinced themselves that there's something wrong with them when there isn't. When in fact, what is wrong is not them, but the way in which the world relates to them. 
And the world is relating to people that way because it's patriarchal, because it's based on colonizing our minds, because we have fossil fuel brains and we're using those fossil fuel brains against ourselves. And because the overarching orientation is patriarchal, these theories were not developed for the most part by women. Women have to become more active in these dialogues, more outspoken. Uh, to me, a very good example, I was just reviewing this, uh, my comments on neurodiversity for a publication. You know, when I was doing clinical research with neurodiverse children, the gurus of autism at that time were promoting this picture of autistic children as touch averse. And I, in my work, which was largely with the children of veterans who are 80% more likely to be diagnosed with autism than the general population. I didn't meet a single child who was touch averse. So the protocols that I was bringing into my research are touch protocols. So I would know if they were touch, not one of them was touch averse, not one. The issue was how was the touch being introduced? If the child felt safe with the touch, there was no aversion to it. Uh, if the child was at home and in their bodies and recognized for being at home in their bodies and the touch was introduced when they were in that state of embodiment, there was no rejection of the touch. In all my research for years, I did not meet a touch averse child. So who had been diagnosed? These children, in order to be in the studies, they had to have an autism diagnosis. Not one of them was touch averse. So this is what I mean by the difference between a feminine trauma-informed approach and a patriarchal one. Now, one of the pieces uh, I'm thinking of with the um, attachment piece evolving as leave it to beaver and uh, the stay at home mom, and this is what we're all supposed to be doing, they, they kind of grew up in the same uh, era together, uh, is that we were never meant to do it alone as women. We were the whole phenomenon of being alone in a house with a baby is. Uh, the opposite and detrimental to mother and baby. There's supposed to be community support. And a part of the evolved nest is multiple caregivers, allo mothering. Um, we, this is how we were supposed to be raising uh, infants as the mother is carried and held. So I see this as this connective piece as well between beyond attachment like let's really put uh, mother, the whole, what do we do to motherhood under the microscope and really understand where did this come from with this? I've been doing this work for a long time. And I remember when I first started trying to advocate for attachment parenting, uh, the, um, the way it was received was, you know, this is hard enough as it is. And now you just made the yardstick even harder. Um, yeah, that was my cat that just went by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thanks for that and I remember thinking well how are we going to resolve what is you know the culture is going to allow us to have while it's pathologizing us for not being able to meet this ridiculous uh, new yardstick of um, you know of the science of the attachment parenting is coming out while women are you know more and more uh, uh, uh expected to fulfill this ridiculous un unmeetable goals, especially uh, in the day of social media. Now the pressure of mothers are under to perform and, and be sure to post online so you can be graded. Um, so so this, uh, this is a subject I, I see uh, uh, and hear from my, from younger women who are in, in there now uh, just saying they're not going to do it. They're just saying they're not going to do it. 
So, and we, and that's evident, that's happening. Women are sterilizing themselves. Uh, right now in the United States, the leading cause of death for new mothers is suicide and overdose. Um, this is a real serious issue that we've uh, forced on women and uh, without any, uh, you know, uh, relief from the, the dominant patriarchal worldview is not gonna come to the rescue now. So again, we have to have help outside the known. We have to go beyond that <laughs> that point that says turn back. There is no more. We have to we have to go out there. And I really appreciate your work, Stephanie, in that you're bringing this um, these concepts to us and showing us there is another way. And there are people who have been living this way and are living this way now. And and then how do we get there? And changing it is aligning ourselves with our original brilliance and this trauma-informed um, feminism. It's a great plan. It's a great plan. <laughs> it's my plan. And I believe it's a workable plan. The new feminism that is trauma-informed, that understands the full scope of what it is possible for a developing being in this time to attach to. I mean, the options are many for healthy attachment for a developing being in this time. And it is the new feminism, and I am particularly excited about the new feminism in healthcare. And I want, I am doing this very deliberately right now because I know women physicians who are struggling right now, struggling mightily, and I wanna shout out to them this is your time. Have the courage to stand in your discoveries, to stand in your awareness. And this system will fight back. I know that. I know that as a clinician myself. I know that as a psychologist and an author, the system fights back. It doesn't want these innovative ideas. It doesn't want ideas expressed lyrically or ideas expressed that are emotional in tone. It, they want a particular language. And so I say to those physicians who have the capacity to reskill medicine, to claim the true medicine of their words, to band together and support one another, and do it because the healthcare system is in shambles. I mean, just today, just an average day, I have heard from four people who were misdiagnosed, who were given the wrong pharmaceuticals and who have suffered severe repercussions, life damaging repercussions as a result. And that is happening more and more and more because people aren't paying attention and they're not taking the time to really attune to the people they have the privilege of serving. So it's a violation of what it means to be a physician. So the women, I'm, I'm really speaking to them directly right now. I'm using this platform to speak directly to them. Those of you who know what's really going on and who are trauma-informed and who know there's another way, go for it. Find your sister physicians, band together, support one another, and go for it because we need you. To me, that's the new feminism. And I just want to point out that your books, The Secret of Resilience, and We Are All in Shock, speak to helping us get out of the freeze state that we're usually in as women, especially women holding back our power so we don't get the backlash uh, from systems that, as you're saying, uh, just don't want to hear. But, you know, those are human beings in, their, in the systems. And I do believe, as you're saying, that they are looking for other ways of being and, and ways to get out. And I really uh, highly recommend... Um, uh, Stephanie's books that have actual practical uh, ways you can work with your own body and your own original brilliance to get out of that freeze and fear state, uh, peel off your fossil fuel brain, <laughs> uh, 
and move into that goddess activism. Oh. Exactly. And I think that goddess activism must also be available to men, but they must be willing to identify goddess activism for themselves and to really avail themselves of the resources that women are absorbing to bring that neuroplasticity that will allow them to challenge systems and offer new ways, even when it's not heavily reimbursed, for instance, you know, uh, even when they are not getting the kudos that they think their life depends upon. You discover your life actually doesn't depend on that. That's not good attachment to be dependent on reinforcement from people who are perpetrating disease upon the world. So that differentiation and the courage to differentiate and stand in that courage comes with the new feminism, with the leadership that has been building on the identification of one's original brilliance, then the willingness to see how you survived and thrived under extremely difficult circumstances when healthy attachment wasn't available. So yes to healthy attachment when it can happen. But what did you do when it wasn't available? Western science would say you did destructive things or you became insecure or you became reactive. And there may have been some of that. I did become insecure, but I also became incredibly creative. And I also had and still have a heart of compassion. Well, I had compassion for my parents because they were not there for me. I had compassion for their circumstances and sought to help them. Many children do that. And that is pathologized, you know, that shouldn't have happened. But that is what allowed you to survive. What were the skills that you developed in that process? So, I mean, I'm not trying to negate the fact that that would have been better not to have been needed, but since it was needed, since you did have to be the caretaker, what was the neurodevelopment that resulted from that? There were losses. I lost a childhood. Basically, I didn't have a childhood. I had a very difficult environment that was violent. Whatever childhood I had was in my relationship with the natural world that was internalized, that was not shared, but which I now share generously with others. Mm -hmm. So those results came out of my original brilliance. And I am completely ready more and more every day to celebrate them. And that's a path that's quite different than repairing insecure attachment. It sounds like you're describing radical acceptance, too, which is not something we have a lot of in our shame-based culture. Like, yeah, this is what happened to me, and this is uh, what I, the skills I developed, uh, one way or the other, that got me through and uh, to the other side. So it's... Uh, yeah, that artificial. We're gonna we're gonna hold you up and compare you to something that's not even real or biologically appropriate. So, uh, the last thing I want to uh, cover with you, uh, real quick, at the end of our hour here is I wanted to say to everyone listening, you know, the the whole doing doing part got really tiring for me uh, too. And what else can I do to help myself? Help myself um, yeah, heal and blah blah blah. And then uh, Stephanie uh, uh, writes poetry. And I, I got to take some of her classes and I got to look at her poetry and I got the amazing privilege of working with her to put together a collection of poetry. This is what we mentioned in the beginning, The Great Physician, Medicinal Poetry for the Anthropocene. And I promise you uh, that book is 
uh, uh, it is medicinal poetry. And you can just have your little wooby blanket and your cup of tea and sit down and read it. And Stephanie teaches classes in regenerative health. And once you get from the beginning of her life and her telling her story of where she was and moving us through this process of expansion and reaching out and, you know, uh, you uh, communing with our trees and our ancestors and making it through just unbelievable trauma, but also unbelievable connection and grace and healing that it is just with the poetry, it comes in a different doorway that doesn't ask anything of us. We don't have to sit there and figure it out or I'm going to now hold this pose or do this thing for myself. You can just read the poetry and it's going to do the medicinal work for you. I'm telling you, it's a great book, Stephanie. A wonderful, Thank wonderful collection. Thank you so much. And we do have, um, I think we have one or two videos of Stephanie reading, uh, of doing the poetry readings from the book. So I'll put those wherever we put this video as well. Thank you so much. You know, uh, poetry is my medicine. It is my original brilliance. And it is my new feminism. I've been writing poetry my entire life. That was where my connectivity with the natural world and with my own original brilliance came through could be put into form and it was such an incredible comfort to me as a child. Even though I was keeping it a secret, I would read over my poems and I would feel so grounded. You might say they brought me polyvagal tone <laughs> to use a contemporary language. They allowed me to rest and digest. They were my mirror, my self-created mirror. And that was so healthy. And anyone who wants to pathologize that, I have compassion for. Well, we know, uh, we know which worldview that would come from, <laughs> which is why, again, the, the worldview chart that Four Arrows created for us, uh, worldviewliteracy.org, that's our new initiative. You can see right in front of you on this lovely uh, chart, you know, where are the precepts coming from, the rigid thinking, the thinking that will doesn't allow for relational ways of being. Uh, that's our dominant worldview. And then our indigenous kinship worldview has a whole different plan for helping us to actually participate in life and claim the, the truth and the human birthright of who we are. So is there anything else you'd like to share? I want to express my gratitude to you for our relationship and for being part of Kindred, which is performing a remarkable service to the world. And I am honored to be part of it. I am honored to work with you, Stephanie. We just went round the horn, attachment, new feminism, holy cow. We're going to have to do more, <laughs> more unpacking in the future. But thank you so much for your work. I welcome response from our readers, and I will be glad to engage further on these topics.